Okay. Boa tarde a todos. Nós vamos dar início a esta sessão, a esta conferência, com o professor Jura Romkovic, a quem eu começo exatamente por agradecer estar connosco neste dia. So I have to thank you again for being with us this afternoon uh, for this uh, conference or seminar under the title of Teaching Computer Science as Integral Part of Science, Mathematics and Humanities. É um título que é bem indicador uh, de, do trabalho que o professor Jurá tem feito no um, Instituto de Tecnologia em Zurique, portanto, no Instituto Suíço ligado à Tecnologia em Zurique, onde tem um, intervenção na área da um, integração de tecnologias digitais, computer science, é a expressão que utilizam, no ensino, em diversos níveis de ensino, e também na formação de professores. Portanto, eu trazo uma visão que, do meu ponto de vista, não é muito comum nós termos, uh, não quer dizer que não haja pessoas que a tenham, mas não é uma visão muito comum nós termos quando equacionamos os problemas da informática ou TIC ou computer science, como quiserem, no ensino, em qualquer nível de ensino. O professor Jurá preparou-nos realmente uma apresentação, nós teremos oportunidade depois de discutir, colocar questões, está bem? Em português e em inglês. Ele vai falar em inglês, de uma forma pausada, e como não é a língua nativa, não é? Porque que o inglês aqui é a segunda língua, certamente vai ser possível acompanhar e compreender. So, thank you again, and uh, I'm asking, I'm telling people that I'm asking you to uh, go in English uh, in a, uh, with a pace, with, not that the people understand every word. Okay? Okay. So, thank you again to be with us this afternoon. So, thank you for introduction. So, hello everybody. Have a nice afternoon. So, the colleagues, I came with the topic computer science in schools here. And as everybody knows, this starts to be an issue in the society to discuss whether computer science has to be a proper subject in the education. And I think the issue is not so easy. Now there are many countries starting to make computer science a mandatory subject. And we have about 20 to 30 years of some development of this, which was not always very successful. Many countries went 20 years ago to some reduction of computer science subject to teaching how to use computer. And I think now it, the time is coming when we really want to, to move to proper computer science. And I mean, uh, what I would like to tell you today is that computer science is a normal subject. Not a very special one, I mean normal in the sense like mathematics, other scientific subjects. Um, especially in that sense that teaching computer science for a teacher does not mean to be an expert about the newest products in software and hardware or the margin and to go in the competition with with your students about this, but really to teach it in the same way as other subjects, when you know there, is, there are some fundamentals, the fundamentals are stable, and you use something which is really sustainable. Okay, so the talk has three parts. First of all, I think in the case of computer science, there is a reason to speak about what it is about. Then after that, we would like to look what does it mean for teaching it. And at the very end, we would like to discuss some didactic approaches about it. 
So, I will start to introduce computer science as a very old discipline, as old as the other ones. And this is the reason I would like to speak about three rules of computer science. So, the first rule is the representation of information. So, it means about data. And now I would try to introduce the history um, in the computer science terminology. So, if you look 4,400 years ago, we had the first big data crisis in Mesopotamia. And this was a very clear problem because this was a country of about one million inhabitants and then has somehow to master everything. So it means property, taxes, taxes were also at that time. And this was not easy if you think about how to make administration if the only one possibility to set information is the mind of, the, of people. So you have officers and what the officers know exist and what they don't know does not exist somehow. And you have to manage all the property, all taxes and things like that. And the result of this first big data crisis, I, I've maybe to tell the meaning of the term big data. Big data does not mean that you have this amount of terabytes of data. Big data means that you have so much information, so many data, that the current technology you have is not sufficient to master to work with them. And they were definitely in the situation much more than we are today. And the result was the invention of scripts, of writings, as you like. And what does it mean is also important because today almost everybody is speaking about digitalization, but very few people know what digital data mean. And if you look on the definition, and not only on the mathematical definition, but I mean on the definition in Oxford dictionaries or something like that, that you can read that digital information representation is nothing else than saving information as a sequence of discrete symbols. Okay? So the alphabet, discovering of alphabet, of writings, what the, was the real and probably the biggest step in digitalization <coughs> since ever. Okay. Okay, so I started with this point. We have now information saved as data. And this really changed the life because what does it mean? I, I am speaking about of materialization of information. You can save it external. Okay. You can transport it, you can sell it. So you have now information as something which is really material, okay? And then what does it mean as a consequence? Um, I like to, to say that computer scientists are specialists in developing writings, different kind of writings. So let me tell you only about four examples of that. First of all, if you have written information, okay, then you immediately have the problem of security, of secure information, okay? So maybe the, in the first time where very, very few people were able to to read and write, this was not a problem because this was some kind of secret writings. But after some time, this became more and more broadcasted. And then this was a really need somehow to, to, to keep, 
the information hidden. And then 3,500 years ago, the first secret writings were developed. And 2,500 years ago, there were many countries with many very well developed secret writings. Okay, this is now the topic of computer scientists. Security is a big topic. So, computer scientists were interested also in other things, for instance, to, to save the information in as small space as possible. So, this means to compress the representation. Another point is completely in the opposite direction. You want to save the information in such a way that if you transport it and it will be damaged, then you are able to recover the information saved there. Just the self verifying codes. And then at the very end, I, I will say something which is the oldest one. Uh, kind of writings from computer science point of view. What we do as computer scientists today, it is not completely arbitrary how we try to, to code or to, I don't want to say code in the sense of programming now. I mean, to code the information, to represent the information. So what we are usually doing, we try to represent the information in such a way that we are able to work efficiently with it, okay? And the, all this very nice example is number representation. If you think about number representation, the, all these cultures did not use decimal system, that they did not use all these very nice formal mathematical systems we use today, not speaking about binary for sure, <laughs> but they used different approaches. For instance, in Mesopotamia, you have this approach, the, 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 the basic stones are one, 10, 60, 360, 3,600, so they multiply alternatively by 10 and 6. And you can ask why. For sure, they wanted to have the information saved in short place. This, was, this worked well. But they wanted to have sizes which can you partition very well. They are divisible. If you look on, on 60, this is a great number. You can divide by. Two, three, four, five, six, everything is working. And this was the reason why they decided for 60. If you look, for instance, on Pisa in Italy, 12th century, they had the sizes of the coins 1, 12, 240, and after that they started to multiply with 10. Okay? And the reason was again the same. 12 is a great number. You can divide it by 2, 3, 4, Six is fantastic, okay? Okay, but with the time, all these systems the people used were very nice if they needed to, to, to make addition. But after starting to use more and more multiplication, the situation changed completely. And none of the system were really able to work properly and efficiently. And then, okay, then the decimal system won the competition. Okay, started with the eighth century and it took a lot of time, four, five hundred years to come to URF. But this was the system where the business was running in the time, in 12th or 13th century. So this was something about writings. Now the second core of computer science is automation and it's with algorithms. So what I would like to say here is the following. I cannot date the time when it started because I think this is the proper way how we people are working. We always try to be efficient. And what does this usually mean? You have somehow to acquire knowledge 
and or I, I like even to say to generate knowledge, and then you use this knowledge to develop some kind of procedures, how to do something, okay? You can produce instruments, you can think about healing procedure, whatever you like. But the point is, if you develop some kind of procedure, today we will speak about the algorithms, okay? But if you develop some kind of procedure, the advantage is the people, they use this procedure, don't need to understand why this procedure works. Only the inventors are asked to do that. And it means this is automation. This is true automation because you enable a big part of the population to use something without understanding why it works. Okay, and this is the way how, how the human society became efficient. So, some small example I have here. You see Pythagoras, everybody knows Pythagoras. This was the technology for building houses in ancient time. Because you took the sizes 5, 4, 3, 3 to 2 plus 4 to 2 is equal to 5 to 2. So you span a triangle with that sizes and you cut the rectangle. This is what you have been searched for. And the point is, the people building houses did not need to understand the theorem of Pythagoras and they don't need to be able to prove it. Okay, but if we really want to speak about true algorithms, they are also very old ones. The old books of Euclid, of elements, is 2,300 years old and we have already algorithms there. The most famous is the Euclid algorithm, anyway. Okay? And if we go still in the history, this is the book, Alkvarizmi. The word algorithms is coming from this name. And this was a really big book, the main source for the whole world at that time, whole civilized world at that time. This was the ninth century about how to work with numbers, but the book is nothing else than full of algorithms. So, okay, so this was the second root of computer science. Now let us go to third one. So the third one is the technology. Okay, I would like to say it's also not from yesterday, so if you look on this picture here, then you can see here some old computers. The Leibniz machine is now more than 300 years old. And on the right side, you see the Babbage machine, which is the first computer you can program. So not one purpose computer, okay? But if you go to the network technology, this is still much older. And this is not a joke. If you look on this, uh, people playing with signals, I don't know how many thousands years ago, you call the information as signals. And they did simply they have some rules and say, okay, this uh, sequence, of signals has these meanings and they did. And this is up to now the base of, of, of all this networking technology. So it's not happening yesterday. Okay. So I try to tell you that computer science and all disciplines, or so some people may now ask, okay, but but why computer science started maybe about 50, 60 years ago in the university, but not earlier? So I, I mean, a scientific discipline does not start to be independent in the time the first result of the discipline are discovered. It starts to be independent if the society needs a lot of specialists with this knowledge. 
And this happens when these two assumptions written here were routed. First of all, we are able to formulate the procedures as algorithms, which mean in such an exact way that this was an unambiguous interpretation of what to do. And there was no expertise needed to improvise with something. So in other words, there was no human intellect needed to perform that, okay? And the second assumption was we were able to create technology that we were able to execute them. And these are the two assumptions that were needed to start computer science as a proper science. Okay, so this was something about the history. And, and what I try to say, I mean, this is with all disciplines somehow. I, I don't try to separate computer science and some disciplines such as say that I, I would like to distinguish this very hardly from mathematics and, and, and science and humanities because everything is for me science anyway. But I try to say that the way of thinking and, and the way uh, some expertise was always the part of human culture. This is what I try to say. It is not a question of which time computer science depends, uh, developed as an independent side of this, but to say what, what I recognize today as a part of computer science in, in the development of the science at all, this is some really integral part of science. Okay, and starting with this understanding of computer science, I would like to present the main goals of teaching computer science. Why to teach computer science today? So I have three main goals, okay? One is really that you understand the world created by humans. And not only that you understand it, but also you are able to control it and you are able to develop it or at least to, to be part of this development, to take influence, okay? Second, for many people is surprising, I say, you can contribute to teaching mathematics and languages if you teach computer science properly. Okay, and the third one is really you decide to bring the way of thinking of technical disciplines to schools. So I would like to go more into details for all these three goals. And you see at the very end the quotation of Sam Papa telling another one reason why we try to go in this direction. I think we, we used to speak about interdisciplinarity already for many years, but the implementation does not work somehow properly, or only to some extent, okay? And I would like to tell you that with computer science, you can do a big step in this direction. And the big step is exactly written here, that on the, on the, uh, bottom part. In fact, in computer science, you can go the whole way the people used to go. You start with acquiring knowledge, you start to apply it, you start to develop something, you start to check whether it works, and you start to think about how to do it better. And you can do it in one subject called computer science. Okay. So let us go to the one goes after other. So I think, I don't know what is the definition of education or, or what are, no, this is not the right way to say it. I don't want to discuss the general definition of education, but, but the two main goals, written in the Swiss rules for education in schools are the following one. The first one is to understand the world. 
And the second one is to prepare young people for professions, for professional work in the future. So the first point is very clear. We need a subject where you learn to understand the word the human created. This is not natural science, for sure. This is about the technique. And I say more, it's not only to understand how it works, but you learn to understand how it works to be able to control this word and to develop this word or to participate in this development, okay? And what about professions of the future? We don't know how they will look like in 20 years. I have no real idea about that. Okay. But what we definitely know is that the automation will be part of the most profession of the future. And the main point is the following one. I mean, I believe that if you want to be successful in some profession in the future, it would be necessary to have a basic knowledge about automation. It is something like 100 years ago, mathematics became very important in the time of technical evolution, but because this was the instrument for everything there. And I mean, computer science is becoming a very similar role as mathematics at 100 years ago. So it starts to be crucial. Okay. This is again something very nice from Simon Papert. And I don't want, you can read it if you like. I don't want to read it. But I would like to, to, to say the essence of that. I mean, we are really creating the world with all this digitalization and technique and whatever. Okay. And you have really. Now, the question, what, what does it mean? Either you don't understand this at all, and then you are completely dependent on what the other people do. It's not only about creating devices and software, it's also about election, and all these things about the society, about social things. Or you are able to understand it, you are able to be part of this, and then you can influence. Okay, so either you stay independent and you are ignorant in this field, or you start to contribute or to be as part of this development and to influence the development. This is the game related to that. Okay, <clears throat> now let us come to old classical subjects that I think the absolutely main two subjects are mathematics and languages. So I think it is not a surprise if I say there is a big overlap between mathematics and computer science, and it is clear that computer science and mathematics can uh, enrich each other. But I would like maybe to make it more precise. For me, mathematics is a language. And the language was developed for two purposes. First of all, if you want to have any kind of objectivity in science, you need a language with an ambiguous interpretation for everybody who understands the language. Okay? And I hope you understand what I mean. Mathematics is a language, each sentence you write in this language has an ambiguous interpretation. This is one reason, you describe the word in this unambiguous language. And the second reason to introduce mathematics was to get language with verifiable argumentation. So everything you claim and you put argumentation or proof, everybody who understands the language is able to verify whether this proof works or not. This is the reason. And this means mathematics become an 
research instrument. So we have two research instruments at all, experiment and mathematics. And this must come also to general education. If you don't sell mathematics as a research instrument, you do something wrong. Okay. So, and how it is related to computer science? What does it mean to teach mathematics properly? It means you are able to abstract. Even if you go to the symbolic language of mathematics, you do abstraction, you do modeling. So one of the main goals of teaching mathematics is to teach abstraction. And the second one, you teach to solve problems. So in the rep mathematical representation, okay? These are the two main things you try to sell in mathematics. And these are also the two main things you try to sell in computer science. Because first of all, you have to get to the description of the word in digital representation. This is nothing else than the mathematical one. Okay, so you train abstraction because without being to formulate your problem in digital representation, you cannot ask the computer to, to work with it. Okay. And on the level of trying to solve problems, you even go farther than the classical education of mathematics, because typically in, in mathematics, you are for the situation, okay, you have some kind of problems, and you try to develop a method for solving them. But the method you have to develop is prescribed. You teach multiplication, you teach solving systems of linear equations, whatever. But there are 100 years old methods and algorithms, and you strive to reach them. In computer science, you have much more of these open-end stories. You put a problem, and you try to solve it. But the goal is not to find a famous efficient method, but to discover some, at least partially working method. And this is really a big contribution if you let everybody, every child in the class, every pupil, to find the solution and the solution are allowed to be different. But they all can be good ones. Okay, and this is something which enables you to do things which really contribute also to mathematical thinking a lot. I will speak about it later, more into detail. Now let us go to languages, because languages is maybe more surprising. I say, okay, we contribute. If you teach computer science properly, we can improve even our knowledge about languages and understanding of languages. Why? I spoke about alphabets, scripts and writings, and I told you that the computer scientists are specialists on that. So for sure, this is one topic. Let us take the another one. What does it mean programming? Maybe I have to stop to make monologue. So what do you think? What, what, what is programming? This is a question, it's a true question. <laughs> So, tell me something. What is programming? Podem responder que eu encarrego-me de dar conta na, na transmissão que estamos a fazer. You may answer in Portuguese or in English. That yes. I will repeat it for the audience that is not with us. O que é programação? Você vai é, pegar elementos que sejam essenciais para aquela, aquela informação e vai construir para que ele tenha um objeto, um formato final. Uma linguagem de computação, por exemplo, você pega uma linguagem natural, você escreve uma linguagem de computador, um objeto,
Okay, if I make the abstract. Yes. Right. Um, um, <laughs> programming is a language that you use to um, build uh, a program and to get some product. Okay. Right, I mean? Very good. It's going in the right direction. I, I will sell it now in the, in, in, in the terminology of languages. Programming means communicating with the computer in the language the computer understands. Okay, this is the programming language. And what you try to communicate is to tell the computer what to do. Okay? But you have a true language. Okay? And then is the question how you teach programming. One way would be to teach programming like you teach foreign languages, which means that you try to teach the meaning of words and you try to teach grammars and things like that. Another way of teaching is, as we try to do is the following one. We start with a very pure language. It means about 10 words. And we used to write very simple programs with it. And after some time, the pupils discover that it is very hard to express yourself in a language with only 10 words. So they would need more. And then we teach the children <coughs> how to teach computer to understand new words. So it means at the very end, each pupil develops its own vocabulary and is allowed to use it. So it means they, they see the procedure of developing a language, added one new word by other, describing the meaning of the new words with the help of the old words. This is something which, which is the nature of development of languages. And if they are older in the high school, we even can allow them to develop a grammar, not to teach them a grammar, to develop a grammar. This is the difference. So in subject computer science, you can teach development of languages and they are allowed to be creators. This is a point. Okay, another point is if you develop algorithms as a method for solving problems, you have to be able to describe this in your language and ambiguous so that everybody is able to perform it. And this is also very good training for communication. There are many other points I don't have time to speak about them, but I will let some textbooks here, also textbooks for teachers, where I'm going very much in detail about this stuff. Okay. The last goal. We are going to thinking in technical disciplines. Um, I mean, I spoke already about this. You have to experience the whole procedure, how people are working. So you start to work with some kind of problem. You make your experiments, your observation. You get some expertise. You use this expertise to formulate your hypothesis, your solution method. You implement your solution method as a program. Let the run the program and look what happens. So test the functionality of what you produced. And then you think about how to correct it, how to improve it and things like that. And this kind you can iterate as long as you like. And this is the proper way how we are working. And this is the way how to bring it to the school. So, let us go to the last part. These are didactic concepts. So we try to teach everything in computer science based on constructivism of Jean Piaget, which means learning by doing. I think already with the last goal I somehow 
try to say that this is the right way to, to teach and to learn. So we try to get the pupils in, in active processes of creating something and to learn inside of these active processes. And especially if we speak about programming, we start to or try to go still farther. Um, this is some kind of deepening of constructivism by Simon Papert. And I think the best short way to, to say it is to say, learning by creating things that do work. You mean, it's more than only learning by doing. The product of your work is something that has some functionality and you test this functionality. This should be also the part of teaching, okay? Um, so in some sense, we merge these all didactic approaches about learning by doing and learning by making things to work with critical thinking. And what does it mean? Critical thinking is, please don't teach the products of science. And I mean, products are not only facts or models. Products are also methods, okay? But try to teach processes to get them, okay? So you really have to go from the motivation, problem formulation, going the way of, of trying to, to understand something, to get some expertise by the experiments, to formulate hypothesis, to verify hypothesis, and so on. So this is maybe the main philosophy together behind ETH theory in the university level of education. But we are very much convinced about that, that this would be something which will go down to education to all schools. And this is part of evolution we cannot avoid. We have to focus on people as creative humans. It means we have to teach how to discover something, how to verify whether it is what we wanted to have, whether it is correct and things like that. We have really to teach the processes, how the people created the knowledge and how they use it and not the product of their work. Okay. And in the select part, the bottom up, you see why we try to do it. And I believe that we will get completely different citizens if we teach in this way. Because, you know, if you look on, on current newspapers, I don't want to speak about political issues. I mean, you have a lot of, of statistics and interpretations of that. This is very common today, okay? The most of them are wrong. Not because of, of the statistic data, but because of the interpretation. And the people are not able to recognize that they are over-interpreted or that they are even wrongly interpreted, okay? And this is all because we don't teach this way of thinking. And this is something we have to change. Okay, so this is only to show that we are not only speaking, but also working. So we have now these five textbooks for teaching computer science as a mandatory subject in Switzerland for classes five to nine. We are working on uh, Eight more for classes from one to four and for high school still. And we have already also for all these five books, as shown here, also five books for teachers because we start with the point 
the teachers did not have computer science as a subject in the schools. So they have to learn what it is about and how to teach it and they need really proper, very detailed material to, to be able to, to, to go. So, before finishing my talk, I'm still allowed. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. I would like to speak about two examples because this was a very abstract label of, of goals and why and whatever. But the question is, Okay, I can show the books, but probably you, you don't read German anyway, <laughs> or very few of you are able to do that. Um, but we are working on translation in five, six languages, so this may change quickly. Um, I mean, let us look on two examples of implementation. So, so I think one subject everybody accepts that is has, to be used in the school is programming. Okay. And programming is start always typically with the question, yeah, what language, what programming language to take and why? And there are fights about it and things like that. Okay. And I mean, we did not start with this fight about what to take we start to, started to think, what are the right criteria for choosing the programming language? And there are different ones, but I think three of them are very crucial. The point number one is, you have to think about what do you want to teach? This means which kind of programming concepts do you want to introduce in which way? In which way means what I already told you, for instance, that you want to teach pupils to develop their own language individually. Okay, this may be one of the purposes. But for sure you can say, I would like to teach loops, I would like to teach if then else or whatever. Okay. The second point is you need a programming platform <coughs> which does not bring additional load, additional cognitive load. If to understand the platform is already something which is not easy, then you are on the wrong side. This must be very natural and very easy, very simple. Okay? And the third point, which is not typical for programming languages you can get, on the market is that you don't want to overload the teacher with searching for mistakes in the program of the pupils. Let you see the real situation. You, you teach programming, is a new language, you, you describe some activities in this new language, and this does not work properly. Half of the children in the class can say, please help me, I, I wrote a program, this somehow does not work. You have no chance. You have no chance as a teacher to be successful. The only one way to master it means that you teach them also to correct their programs. If you look on, on, on computer scientists in the practice who use to do programs, the very optimistic statistic is telling that three quarters of your time you are searching for errors in your own programs. And this is very optimistic statistic, okay? And you cannot teach programming in this way. So it means you, you need a platform that really supports you in that and you can teach the pupils to find errors in programs. And the result of this three criteria is that we developed for all age levels proper languages for this purpose. We did not take any of them which are on the market. Okay. And these are, would be available also in many languages. It's no problem. They are for free. Everything is for free. And they have this special property for sure. They are simple. 
the support to reach the goal we want to reach. But the main new part, the original part, is, is the errors. You have much better debugger as the normal languages have. So I mean syntactic error like misprints or grammatical errors are pointed out colorfully. So the people, the, the pupils immediately see, oh, this is written wrong way, this is this. So they can correct this by themselves. And the main part is, is, is logical errors. How to correct logical errors, how, how, how the pupils can, can find it. And this is the reason why when we start the introductory courses in programming, we start not with calculations. Because if you calculate and you want to recognize that the computer produces wrong results, you have to calculate as well. And this costs a lot of time. We don't have this time. So what we do, we draw. We are drawing and you immediately see if you draw something what you did not want to draw. Okay? And then how to support to, to search for logical error we have a special debugger, special system. The pupils can choose um, a modus, executing the program step by step. So step by step is now, you have to take care what does it mean. If you have a loop, it does not mean that you have loops, for instance, repeat or something like that for, and, and you, you execute this one. Step by step mean you go inside of the loop and execute one instruction in the loop. And this is now red one on your screen. And then you put return and the next one will be. So you can, you can really control completely the execution of the program. And you can recognize the point where the program start to work in the wrong way. And then you can think about it. And this helps somehow to, to make, I will say, teaching program tractable, okay, for the teacher. So, I spoke already about this philosophy that you teach programming by creating your own programming language, which is also very crucial in our approach. And the order how we teach is something people, so I, I have to say we had a lot of large experience. We had about 13, 14,000 pupils in experiments, which means 20 lessons per pupil over 15 years. And for instance, we don't have any gender problem. We had almost exactly in this big data, the whole values in the, in the the quality of results for girls and for boys. And this is related also to, to the philosophy, how, how, how we work with them. You know, programming usually starts with teaching variables. If you take pupils in the age of 10, you can forget about. If you take variables, it's a, such a big abstraction, much more complex than in mathematics even, because you change the values of the variables. You have, you have a way of notation which contradicts to the notation of mathematics. This is crazy. So we use the idea of puppet. This is the concept of modularity, which is also related to languages. You start first one program, one activity, one picture. There is no variable there, okay? Then you go to loops. If you want to repeat some activity several times or to draw some patterns several times. And the Papa proposed implementation where you don't need variable for that because you simply say, Repeat seven times this and this. There is no variable in this. The variable is behind, but you don't see it, and this is the point. And this is something children understand very well. It's no problem with that. And the next step is modularity. 
And this is very crucial. You write one program, for instance, um, drawing a square. Then you name the program square, and then you have new word in your language, new instruction square, and you write square, the square will be drawn. Okay? And this is still the game, one program, one activity, one picture. Okay? Uh, but you can do amazing things with that, already with that. We even can, can program movies like in the sense of animation with this very few things. Okay. And then the last stage we, we use in the age 10 to 12 is a partial introduction of arrival. And partial introduction of arrival means you introduce arrival <coughs> as parameters, which means they don't change their value during the execution of the program. They use it only as an input. But this is the biggest step because you have to understand what really happened behind. If you start to use parameters, the input for the program, this parameter decides of the size of the picture, of the color of the picture, maybe of the form of the picture. Okay? And it means in that moment the program is not written for drawing one picture. The program is universal. There is, you can use the program for infinitely many pictures depending on the value parameter. And this is the reason why this step is really big, big, big one. Okay, maybe the biggest steps in, in teaching programming. And you have to work very carefully on that. Okay, this was something about programming. And now about learning by doing with some subject that in the form of computer science unplugged. It means not programming, not the screen, not the computer. You want to teach some concept of computer science without computer. Okay, so let us take the classical topic, this is the secret writings, okay? How we work with this? We follow the history. We simply start 3,500 years ago and bring the first examples of secret writing where you change the position of symbols in some uniform way to get these secret writings. Okay, but the game, the game is not that you want to teach some methods that people use the time and you are able to use it, it's much more. We bring it as an example, we explain the principle of that and let the children develop their secret writings. So they are free to develop on this principle different kind of secret writing to test them to play with them. And then we cont continue in this way. 2,500 years ago, we get this exchanging symbols by symbols, or coding symbols by sequences of symbols, and they again learn the principles, and then they are asked to create their own secret writings with this style, and tests and things like that. And they are fantastic games there. I think one of the nicest systems are coming from the area of old Palestina. Unfortunately, I don't have prepared it here, but, but it's really nice. The main principle that time for developing secret uh, writings was the following one. You are not allowed to write the secret writings down. Because this is dangerous, because somebody can get it and then they know the secret. So, only systems were allowed that you can save in your mind. Okay? 
And then the question is how to develop some system which is not completely easy, that cannot be broken very easily, but you can save it in your, in your head, okay? And what they develop a very nice idea. How to develop new alphabets, okay? And then to assign the symbols of your alphabet to the new symbols. This is crazy because if you take the Latin alphabet, you have 26 symbols. And if you develop 26 new symbols and then you do some correspondence that are plenty of these possibilities, then, then you have to, what the people were able that time to do is to, to save the order of symbols in alphabet. But to develop completely new symbols and to save the order, this is crazy. What they did, they designed tables. For instance, I will say table of the size three times nine. And then they used to, to write the Latin alphabet in the rows of the, of the table. And then they, dis, they took three new symbols for labeling the rows and nine new symbols for labeling the columns. And then for each symbols in the alphabet, they combine these two symbols in the row in the code to one new symbol. It's a very nice game because you are completely free how to do it. You, and you can really save this information in your, in your mind. And these are really creative games what they can do. And then this is still what we, what we really are able to teach children in the age 10 to 12. This is this two first book on the upper side. And we finish in this age with seventh century, with first method for breaking such systems without getting the secret, to discover the secret for the secret codes we get, okay? And I think I don't have time to continue in this direction, but at the very end, the game is the following one. We make the pupil to be expert of developing secret writing for some age of the development. I think it's, it's nothing special. We also don't start mathematics with number theory and uh, analysis but we're developing on, of number representation and, and basic operations over the numbers. And this is exactly the same way we do, but in some way we give more freedom for learning by doing in the sense that, that we really force them to develop their own writings, secret writings and to test it, to try to break it, and things like that. So they really play the game of inventors, not getting information how the people work with this. Okay, okay. so I mean, I used to speak a lot of time. Yes. Yes, so maybe okay. there's a time for questions yes. and discussion, if you like. Okay, first of all, thank you for your Stimulating presentation. Thank you for um, your attention. Now we will, uh, we have, uh, of course, time for questions and comments. Um, podem fazer os vossos comentários em português, em inglês, a forma como entenderem que é mais interessante e mais adequado. Um, precisam de uma pausa para fazer as perguntas. E é só que dissessem o vosso nome antes de fazerem as perguntas. So now the dangerous game is starting. Now yes. we move around. <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> E quando fala em, em, em educação, 
chip, né, na, na educação, uma coisa que me chama a atenção é que a, a, essas aulas continuam sendo dadas como em caixinhas, de uma forma que o aluno não, tem, não, não pensa, não aprende a lógica que tem por trás da programação, ainda bem a, a manipular caixinhas. É como se, se mata mais de aprendência a, a aplicar uma forma e não pensar como ela foi feita. Esse é um ponto. O outro ponto é que essas aulas são ministradas por um professor a parte de tudo que está com os demais. Por exemplo, é, em vez de colocar da TIC e ensinar matemática, que são professores de matemática que estão tá indo, usar essa, essa linguagem, essa, esse conhecimento para ensinar matemática, é um professor a parte. Da mesma forma na biologia, da mesma forma em outras é, especialidades. Então, eu queria entender se, assim, se isso é algo que tem aqui em Portugal, no Brasil, ou, ou se também na Suíça funciona assim, ou seja, essas aulas são apartadas em caixinhas, onde as pessoas não, não, não trabalham com a transdisciplinaridade que essa ferramenta pode trazer. Ok. Uh, I will try again to make a short abstract. Um, she is from special education mm -hmm. and uh, she was uh, putting the uh, issue of uh, when we introduce ICT in education, um, the school tends to teach um, subjects in boxes, box of mathematics, boxes, mm -hmm. box of biology and so on. And uh, at the same time, there is one teacher for each subject. Mm -hmm. um, the question is how this goes in Portugal and how this goes in Switzerland in terms of uh, this uh, teaching in boxes. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Okay. So I think this is partially true because for the first six classes, at least, we have one teacher for everything. So in that part, this is not a question because the teacher can decide uh, how to work with this and they, they are really allowed to use all this connection overlaps and things like that, and they do, okay? I know there are other countries like Germany, they have only four years like that, and after that, they have only specialization. Mm -hmm. Yes, but as well in Portugal, is that the system? Yeah, okay. And then in the specialization, we have usually on the first stage up to the class nine, um, teachers who have uh, three to five specialization. So they have also the possibility to do that. But on the other hand, I would say the following one. These textbooks are written for teaching computer science. But what I try to tell you that the best way to teach it, to, to, to teach is in the context of other ones. So you have the subject, okay? And you teach computer science, but you are thinking all the time on the contribution to other areas and use the knowledge from other areas. This is the way how you, how you have to work with this, okay? It is clear for me that I cannot change the system in that sense that, that you will teach everything in, in, in strong combination. But what I try to say, if, if you teach computer science and any other subject as well, it is a wrong way to think very, in a very narrow way about this subject and to teach it. I think the best teaching is always that you see your subject in the context and try it, and, and are able to, to, to bridge. This is what I, mm -hmm. and I, I try to now, to develop computer science subject from the very beginning in this way, not after 10 years when we recognize we have to bridge it, but they try to bridge it from the very beginning. Okay. No caso de Portugal, I will expand just uh, as in Portugal, a questão era também em Portugal. Em Portugal é um bocado como foi referido na Alemanha, né? temos professor do primeiro ciclo, os primeiros quatro anos, nós chamamos de primeiro ciclo, ensino primário, né? e depois a partir do quinto ano de escolaridade, é um professor por área que pode ser ligado a ciências como matemática, história, geografia, enfim, mas é, é a pluridocência, né? é mais do que um, um professor. A resposta que o professor Jurado deu relativamente 
ao computer science poder ser um ponto de entrada para favorecer a interdisciplinaridade, no fundo, trazer, um, pode ser, da, digamos, da iniciativa do professor de computer science, ou do professor de matemática, ou do professor de outra. Se todos tiverem a iniciativa, era uma escola excelente, de certeza, porque então estavam todos a colaborar com, com todos. Obrigado também. Um, sim? Um, there is a question here on the. So, so man, there is a question here. Uh, it's very quick to place. Um, is there a place on the web where we can visit material you are using to feed children? Yes, yes. Okay, I, so I would, I would share it. With, okay. We, we have a platform for. For sure, it is in German. This is the okay. problem. But there are about 2,000 pages of. of uh, teaching materials and okay. all our platforms we develop. Okay, so, so I, I will share it. No. Sim. I will try to do it in English. Sure. Um, I apologize if I do some mistakes. Um, as a math teacher, I think it's amazing teaching science, computer science in schools because you Develop the knowledge of the students as proofs in math because if they have to create a program language to do something like um, how to solve an equation of the first degree, they have to know what they are doing and this program has to uh, value for all the equations that they are mm -hmm. solving. So I think it's developing the knowledge of proofs. So, like proofs in math, not so um, deep, but as superficial. You have to be careful with this. You are not allowed to try to study too early because this universality, to give a proof that something is working properly, definitely many cases, is extremely hard story. So at the very beginning, if we start the first years, nothing, nothing about that. The way how we teach it that you, you get some kind of problem and then you sample expert. Okay, you have to define the problem. I define the problem as an infinite collection of problem instances that have something in common. This is inofficial definition, but I understand that. And what we start to do with the pupils is that they learn to solve a few, some very small instances and get some expertise. The time when they are able to develop an algorithm for that, and maybe, maybe to think, not formal rules, why it works, it starts in high school, not before. The first nine classes, nothing of that. Okay, so they solve small problem instances, maybe more by experiment than by an effort, and simply develop maybe some heuristic for that, but not about proving this correctness and things like that. But what they do by programming is definitely that they implement uh, their hypothesis and they can look what happens. But we move to calculation at earliest by class seven, not before. Up to class seven, they use only to draw pictures because they can control the correctness of, of their products. Okay. Yes. This is very hot topic you speak about. <laughs> and uh, my question is about, uh, you mentioned that you have to be careful with this if it's a presentation study or uh, like a learning system, and uh, half of presentation, half of a distance education. Okay. I'm not so much favor in, in this distance education. So, I mean, we used to build also online systems for different topics. But I think the most valuable 
in education is the interaction between the learners and the teacher. This is something you can try to make more efficient in the sense that you, you try to save costs and you, you build these MOOCs, okay? But I, I think you, you, you can never uh, replace the teacher in, in uh, an equivalent, valuable way, I would say, okay? So, so I, I am really of the opinion, because also this, this, this learning by doing, as we practice, is very important that you try to do something, but, not, but this, this is not done after you, you did something. You have to discuss with somebody about what you produced. You can get the feedback not only from the computer by looking on the execution, but you have to have the ability to speak with somebody about it, to discuss it. And, and, and this is something, you know, if, if you build some system, okay, this can have very nice properties and to be able to correct you and, and things like that. But if you, and what we try to do is really to bring some original solutions, some original ways. You cannot build a system which will correctly react on, on things that you did not see a, a, as a creator of the system before. If you, if you bring a completely new method, you did not expect it, the system is not able to work with it properly. So, so I am very much in favor of, of, of not of presentations, but on the interaction of the, of the, of the teachers with the pupils and, and between the pupils. Okay. <laughs> I want to put a question. Um, you, you made a statement. Yeah. Um, for me, quite strong. You, you said that um, computer science today takes on a similar role as mathematics at mm -hmm. the time of teaching, sorry, of technical revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure who is here in the field of mathematics education, you are, but uh, I will be seriously concerned uh, if you are a mathematics educator or a mathematics teacher, um, because this is a huge challenge for mathematics teacher and the people who develop mathematics curriculum mm -hmm. and mathematics syllabus. Um, this, I can look at the estimate to say, okay, mathematics is that, at least this mathematics is that. You don't need to teach it in school. By the way, this is my view. This is um, rubbish. You are teaching mathematics that is no more needed. Um, but uh, what is the feeling of the mathematics teachers when they face these kinds of ideas. Um, you move, the move is to uh, transform mathematics in another thing, mathematics teaching in another thing, or to incorporate computer science in mathematics, because these become two domains or two areas that merge or fight. So I'm not for fighting. <laughs> this is the short answer. I, I'm but, stressing but, it. <laughs> yes, yes, but, but let us, let us um, take it more carefully. I mean, if you look on the basic theory, so I, I see computer science as a merge of mathematics and engineering. The basic concept of computer science on the theoretical level is nothing else than mathematics, okay? So the intersection between these four is, is huge. And what computer science has and, and mathematics does not have, at least not directly, is this engineering part. If you develop really software, hardware, combine it, test it, and things like that, this is what you usually don't do as mathematician. You, you are allowed, but I mean, usually it is not the proper work of a mathematician. Um, 
but if you if you really look on this from the point of view of history that computer science as it in, 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 in its fundamentals grew inside of mathematics okay so if you want to interpret my statement in another way it is maybe the statement telling that another part of mathematics starts to be as important as the old part you used to teach now okay this algorithmic part is dynamics and things like that i am a little bit critical about this old fashion of teaching mathematics uh, not only because you you teach products of mathematics you, you can think about this system of linear equations it's a very nice example you have some efforts allowing you to solve systems in such a way that you multiply one equation and add it to another one i did not find any one teacher including high schools who was able to give me the proof that it does not change the set of solutions is if you have any equations you are in the n dimensional room and the set of solution is a polyhedra in this room and that it does not change this polyhedra oh it is so complex okay so it means we teach an algorithm to pupils it is an algorithm and they don't understand why it works okay and this question is it good or not we try to be efficient so it means what we teach in that moment is something each computer can do much faster than people can do is definitely um, um, more trustable what the computer does because the probability that I, I would do errors is much higher than, than, than something happens with a computer. Okay? And this algorithm needed several hundred years to be developed. And the problem is that you don't speak about this development. The original stage of development of this algorithm is understandable because you still focus how to solve it. And then at some stage, the people start to think about how to make it efficient, how to compute what we would like to compute with minimal number of operations. And then another development took part. And if you take these 20 steps of development, don't speak about it. We get product, we don't understand why it works and how it works and why it is as it is. Okay, and this is my point. We have to get more focus on, on this way, how we develop something and not how, we, how to learn to work with something somebody else developed for us. Okay? Uh, but this is only a didactic example. I mean, we used to teach quite amount of this functional analysis, okay? Without telling properly what Limas is about, because it looks like to be a complex concept in mathematics. This question is, it is right. We analyze functions, the pupils don't see the abstraction of this function. They don't see processes, you express due these functions, okay? And the question is, is it right or not? Okay? So, and this is the one level. And another level is that, I mean, another part of mathematics became more common and more needed. If you take probability and statistics, can you tell me one area where you don't use statistic and empirical research and things like that. So statistic, the way of thinking in statistics is probably much more important than the way of analyzing extreme on functions. I don't understand what the function is about. Okay. And then you can go in this part of algorithms, which is also a discrete mathematics in some sense. And you can ask again, we have probably to take more time for that than 
for the functional analysis. Okay. And I think geometry, I think this is still very important because this is how we are, how we see the world. I mean, if you teach it properly again, if you teach it in the development, because people develop geometry to be able to, to get some orientation in this physical world. This is the reason for geometry. I mean, and I, I think these are many other things where we probably have to, so, so what mathematics needs, but it is very hard because you have this internationally running for 100 years almost in the same way. I said that current mathematics is the product of technical revolutions, mm -hmm. okay? And the question is how to change the development in the way that you give more focus on, 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 on some part of mathematics that became more important to understand for us. This is, this is the proper question we have now. And I see in that sense the computer science as a part of mathematics. Okay. Okay. I want to give, uh, quero dar-vos a oportunidade de fazer perguntas ou comentários. Também. Ok, let's have a question. Espera, espera, só um pouco. Good training. Thank you for your presentation. My name is Paul Arlenz. I'm a computer science or informatics teacher. Many years ago, you asked us uh, why teaching informatics in school is as important as teaching, teaching maths and science. You, you still have the same answer to this question? Or you can change why teaching in the Martin School is more important than uh, teaching maths. No, no, no. Uh, the, the, uh, it's, it's just a, a challenge. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to say that something is more important than other things because this is definitely wrong. Uh, to compare biology, physics, chemistry, and, and, and all of this discipline influence our life amazingly. We are not able to measure the influence of each one of these disciplines on our life. And I don't want to say now computer science is more important than the other one. I only try to say that computer science is important than the other one. So this is the point. So to take it seriously, because computer science had the problem, especially in the West countries, is completely different tradition in, in the East Europe. I can tell you, I was in the high school 1973 to 1977. I had all these four years, four lessons in computer science per week. And I would say even the concepts we learned at that time there are still by own the concept that people are thinking today whether to teach them or not. Okay, so I'm coming from other culture. And in this other culture, computer science in, is, is understood as important as the other subject. It's normal. And what I try to say is take it normal. Okay, not as the most important subject of all, it is not, but as important as the other ones. But what is really the change if you follow the development also in the industry and the society at all? is that the, this is the age where the computer science gets its influence. We had the time of chemistry, we have still the time of biology and medicine, but the computer science is really influencing now everything. So it starts to be really one of the very important subjects. And, and what I try to tell my reason for arguing that computer science is as important as mathematics, for instance, is that really you, you will need this knowledge if almost everything will be automized, automized, then you cannot be expert in some field if you don't understand the automation in your field. Okay? 
This is one of my arguments. Mais comentários, perguntas? Ok. I have a question here on the, on the web. Uh, how the teacher can motivate the students to learn programming? Uh, how can the teacher motivate the students to learn programming? Okay. So I must say we never had troubles with motivating pupils to teach programming. But, but I mean, this is about the way how we teach. Okay, I know situations, especially for instance in the US, where you are not allowed to say the word programming in the education because it is related to such negative emotions. Because they try to teach programming as very technical. <laughs> what, what is programming? If, if, if you take all these words which are not very nice and, 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 and you write symbol by symbols and, and this is really something like, like the US start to call it now coding. So it is something, it's a language which is not well understandable. This is something not so natural. You, you don't like it. And if you do it really technical and if you try to follow the ideas of people in industry telling, oh, we have to teach what we are doing now, then it, then this is disaster. Then you will get the situation that, that, that you have troubles to motivate pupils to, to learn. But if you follow the puppet with, with this great idea, so our trouble is, our, and I told you we have had a thousand of pupils, our children don't want to go for break because they want to finish the product and test whether it works properly. They want to go home even, or for lunch, because they want to finish what they started to do. We have the opposite trouble, but this is the question, how you teach it? Our experience is if you start to teach in a, using simple platform, and the pupils are able to write in 10 minutes the first programs that works, this is feeling of success. And feeling of success is the best motivation I, I, I know. So if you teach them in a way that they feel to be successful, you have the opposite problem as motivation. This is my answer to this question. Okay. <laughs> Não sei se tem mais alguma questão que queiram ainda colocar. Sim. What? So. Okay, you want to comment on that? Yes, uh, I, I think <coughs> what is the really the real life about how, how we work since thousands of years? We always try to do something. And then, then we are looking what happens, and then we are trying to improve. Even mathematicians forget about this great mathematics that is always true and, and produce perfect products. I mean, you have to look on the procedure, how the mathematicians discovered this. And, and if you look on, on, on even in old manuscripts of mathematicians for 100 years, okay? They really tried. They made errors. They corrected some errors and made another errors. This is exactly the same procedure in mathematics as, we, as I propose now for computer science. 
is only the difference in, in teaching. You, you, you take the product of amazing people and teach the product instead of teaching the way how they discover it. This is the difference. Because if you get a mathematical proof, this is the product of work of many years, maybe of many people. Okay? Yeah, and this, no, it may be wrong. Yeah. 20, in 2000 or 200 years. Yeah, but, but okay, you, you have this verified argumentation. Okay? So if, if, if you take the, the, the axiom of mathematics, okay, if you take this, then you can say, okay, this, this is. This works. This is this is the, the right fit. But I, what I try to say, the way to discover is, is exactly the, the way I, I try to focus in, in teaching computer science. That you really try. You make experiments, and from these experiments, you get some expertise, and you improve your expertise until you can really capture something and you say, okay, then it is. This is the right way how to do it, okay? At the very end, you have this, almost this final product of mathematics because it is not perfect, but it is, it is really something working properly and then you like it and it's fine. But I think the point is really in the, in the way how you teach it. So uh, I think the mathematicians in their proper way, they works, as engineers, anyway. Yeah? But they sell the product of their work as, as truth. This is the difference. Okay. Muito obrigado. Um, eu quero um, saudar as pessoas que estão online a acompanhar e também os presentes, agradecer-vos a vossa participação neste seminário e conferência. E, finally, I want to thank you again to be, for Thank being you. with us this afternoon and for your stimulating um, presentation and discussion. Thank you again very much. Thank you. So, thank you for attention. It was a pleasure to meet you here. And I wish you a lot of success in teaching computer science in Portugal. <laughs> thank you.